Hey, everybody. Really appreciate you being here today. I've got I say this every time, I got a real special one, but you know, to me, this one is real special because as we continue to honor track and field coaches around the world, we had a real hot series. We did a three-parter with Harry Mara, one of the greatest coaches, greatest decathlon coaches in the world. And we thought about, what about a part four? Maybe you just haven't gotten enough of Harry Mara. So this time, instead of hearing from Harry, we've invited Ashton Eaton onto the podcast today. He is going to give us the real story. So we've heard Harry's view. <laughs> now we're going to hear Ashton's view. Ashton, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Mike. Uh, this is super fun, and uh, the Harry series was great. But I'm happy to tell tell my side of the story, and you know, having worked with him for that entire time. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, let's get started. Let's go back. Harry was talking about when he came up to Eugene and you and Bree interviewed him. That's kind of unique. Uh, tell us how that went and what did you think about it when you first met him there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our coach before Harry Kane um, had decided to go back to his hometown and, and get a coaching job there. And so we were looking at going into our junior, my junior year for me and uh, Brianne's sophomore year for a new coach. And at that time, Vin Lanana was the head coach of University of Oregon and said, hey, we want to get a quality co coach up here for this program, um, not only for the different events that they need to cover, but also for you and Brianne. And we would like you to interview a series of coaches. And so we said, sure. I mean, we were young athletes at the time. I'd never been anything through anything like this. But uh, I remember <laughs> when Harry came up. Frankly, I don't really don't remember a lot that he said, but he had said I coached uh, some athletes towards the Olympic Games and this and that, have a lot of history. And um, but the whole time he was talking, I was looking at his hands <laughs> because he he has this condition called Dupatrons, which forces the tendons in your hands to um, essentially shorten over time. And so his fingers are like chronically bent. <laughs> and I was just like, I've never seen anything like it. And I said, what is wrong with this guy's hands? <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm surprised, you know, he kind of glossed over the story, but he said all this stuff. And I just said, what's wrong with your hands? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, long story short, um, whenever we asked him a question, he, he kind of had the answer. And it was clear that he had knew way more than we did. And um, we really felt comfortable with him. And so, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, he was at practice with us and you know at the time I actually don't think I told him this either in the in the interview but I had an injury I had a meniscus tear that I was recovering from and so not only did he kind of leave his California dream to come up to rainy Eugene Oregon and coach some athletes um, but one of them you know he'd be tasked with hey we're trying to get these people to championships because they had already won I right. already won NCAAs Brian had uh, done well as well so it was like no, but one's also injured <laughs> so he's probably pulling his hair out but um, yeah, it was a very interesting process. He said what he told his wife. She's like, where are you going? He's like, I guess I'm going to Oregon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just drove up from that, uh, that California dream. And he drove and up you... in a 1995 Miata, which he had until we were done. <laughs> I'm shocked he doesn't still have it to be real, <laughs> real yeah, exactly. frank. as much as I know him I know it was hard to part with that thing um, before that interview did you know of Harry at all and his legacy and what he had done before I had no clue I mean at that time again I'm going into my junior year so I just had one NCAAs and I was still very naive in the decathlon uh, kind of world and sport um, but some of the names he had mentioned, uh, coaching and being around like Dan O'Brien and even our coach uh, at the time, Dan Steele, mm -hmm. knew of Harry. And so that kind of uh, preceded him a little bit, but I, I had no clue who he was or what he did. And interestingly enough, I had actually met him um, my freshman year and I had no clue. So the very first decathlon I ever did was at um, University of Arizona. It's called the Jim Click Shootout. Mm -hmm. And I remember I scored 6,977 points. And there was an athlete there. His name is Paul Tarek. And yeah. he was, you know, going, charging for the Olympic Games and supposed to go to the Olympic trials. And uh, I think by the end of day one, I was like beating him. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but my coach was sitting next to Harry Merrick because Harry was coaching mm -hmm. Paul Tarek. And Dan Steele, who was my coach at the time, tells the story. He's like, yeah, I was sitting next to Harry. And I said... Harry, 
you got to watch this kid, Ashton. He's going to be something someday. And I was pole vaulting, so it was the second day. And Harry was worried about Tarek because he was not performing well. And he goes, yeah, okay, sure, Dan. And Dan goes, no, no, watch him. And so I, apparently at that point, I ran down the, the pole vault runway. I, I put the pole in the box. I went up, and I did a front flip and a somersault and went all over the place. Oh, Harry wow. goes, Dan, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> if he's gonna be something you better be something as a coach yeah, that, i think that's the first time harry ever saw me <laughs> that's interesting see this is exactly why we wanted you on the podcast so he told that story on the podcast it, it actually meshed up really well i was waiting for some inconsistent you know memory inconsistency yeah, that yeah. was that was perfectly it that's awesome yeah um and so tell us about harry's style as a coach how well did you mesh with him when he first came onto the scene with you and uh, were there any adjustments you guys had to make you know this was my first experience kind of getting a new coach and i was very skeptical when harry first came on to the scene we had our program in oregon it was clearly working like i said i was having a lot of success and so um Harry came in and, you know, at the time he like didn't even know how to use his cell phone. <laughs> he had one of those like, flip phones, didn't know how to text. And that was kind of like a main method of communication. So I was like, geez, this guy doesn't even know how to use a cell phone. Like, how's he going to train us in the cat That's awesome. <laughs> um, but he took about two to four weeks to just watch what we did. And he said, I'm not going to change anything. You guys have obviously got a thing going here. Um, let me just watch and observe. And, you know, at the time, we were not great throwers in our respective kind of events of heptathlon, decathlon, but, um, and Harry was more, more, more of a guru in the, the multi-event throws. And so we were looking kind of for him to, to make some adjustments there. But yeah, I, th I would say at the beginning, I was really skeptical. I didn't know the guy at all, had no idea of his training style. Um, he's, he started talking about things like being really into weightlifting and throwing technique. And we were more running oriented and very proud of how, we were able to run very fast um, short sprints, but also, you know, the 15 and the 800 meters. And so, uh, yeah, you know, those initial first weeks, I just remember thinking, I don't know how this is going to turn out. You know, it's, it's funny. I think of you as Ashton Eaton now and what you've accomplished. I, we have to remember that, yeah, you were really only two years into decathlon. It's not like you did a lot of decathlons through high school and summer track, things like that. You were still a very uh, infant as it came to the, Decathlon, even though you were a national champion, you were a well-accomplished infant, <laughs> but yeah, still yeah. Uh, very young in the uh, the history and training and things like that of, of the decathlon. Yeah, absolutely. I so, think that uh, by 2008, I think that was maybe my sixth decathlon. Is that right? I think so. Wow. G good memory, by the way, that you remembered your very first score in the decathlon. Was that a memorable one, just as far as like you, you got your first one done and now it was all uphill after that? You know, I think it's... Um, you always remember your first decathlon. There's nothing like it. <laughs> I, I hope to never do a decathlon, so I don't ever want to remember. <laughs> you should. You should. <laughs> no, no, no. Unless they came up with some kind of work from home, going to the fridge, uh, video conferencing, uh, yeah. cell phone. That's my decathlon right there. Got it. Well, obviously things worked out. You learned how to, but both of you guys learned, Harry and you and Bree learned how to mesh, what to do, how to do it, things like that. One of the things that really impressed me uh, with Harry's style as he was talking about the process of coaching and the process of taking you through your last couple of years of college and then onto the um, post-collegiate professional ranks was his ability to understand that he doesn't have every answer and that he could go figure it out. So he, he gave a lot of examples of, uh, there was a, I think it was the, maybe that first year, it was at indoor nationals and you had done real well in the first six events of the indoor multi. And you had asked him something about, you know, what, what do I need to run to set the collegiate record? And he mentioned he had all the, you know, the press and coaches and everybody's around. And he goes, most people would probably BS some answer. He goes, honestly, I had no clue, not only no clue what he had to run, but how he was going to run, because it had to be a PR, I believe. And you had just PR'd the, the one before. So he says he goes outside, sits under a tree, and just starts figuring it out. Uh, how did that style work for you with a coach who didn't pretend to know it all, but would come back eventually with an answer that obviously worked? I mean... So, you know, I talked about those, those first initial weeks when we were, when we were young athletes and we first met Harry, um, kind of wondering how this was going to work out. And, you know, very 
quickly started working out great. Um, his coaching style was one where he has so much knowledge from previous coaching previous athletes and doing the decathlon himself. Um, but he doesn't bring that to you in like an arrogant way. It's almost like he, he sits on it, rests with it, and treats each indiv individual athlete differently. And for him and I, I'm much more of a, a, an acquisitive athlete, I think, and likes, likes to figure things out for themselves. So when we would be discussing a, a technical problem or something goal we were trying to go towards, it was very much a mutual, um, respectable discussion. And Harry didn't have to do that with me at, at such a young age because I would tell him things like, I don't think what you're telling me is right. And he had the patience and the respect and the forethought to know and be okay with the fact that I was, I could be right, but I was most likely wrong based on his experience. And he was willing to give me the time that, and the experience that I needed to figure it out, if that makes sense. Instead, so, of, instead of a, hey, I'm the coach. Exactly. Shut up and go do it. Exactly. And so, you know, a real concrete example would be the shot put. And um, he, would, he would come with different methods that I just never been about or knew about. And I would try them. And a per, being a person who wants, you know, instant results right away to be good overnight, you know, I would try and say it didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not right. And uh, he would just have the patience to say, no, let's try it, let's try it. But then also hear me out. It's like, you know, listen, I'm feeling this. And then I, I think I have to try that. And so we would try it, uh, sometimes for years, you know? And um, it was really this, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's, it's his patience and his ability to have coached so many athletes that he knows the, the path that you're on and the mistakes that you're gonna make. And he tries to tell you, watch out for these mistakes, but he still is okay letting you make them, knowing that you most likely need to in order to actually start moving forward and progressing. But what's beautiful is he helps you overcome them so quickly. And it's not in a, I told you so type of manner. You know, it's like, the, I, I do remember many a times where we would do something that he had said for years and it would work out and continue to work out. And we, we jokingly say, why didn't you tell us that before? And he just throws <laughs> hands up in the air. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, he's just, he's really mastered. Um, I think he also calls it this as well, the art of coaching. Mm -hmm. And it really is an art and an intuition and it's based on experience. Yeah, it was fun that uh, three-part series, that middle one, we kind of took a break between his coaching career and then the, the second part of the career of the interviewing at Oregon and then on through your retirement. Uh, that second part of that series was all about that art of coaching he calls PKTC. It's episode 26. It was really interesting to hear his thought pattern on the overall arching coaching, the art of coaching, not just how to work with the calf lead in the vault or the hundred or, or whatnot. Yeah. One, one of the stories we didn't get a chance to talk to you, you brought it up there just a little bit. I'd love to hear your, uh, well, you're, you're going to have the only side because Harry didn't get to talk about this is that shot putting the, the shuffle kind of style. How did that come about? Was that, was that one of the, uh, I don't want to call it an argument. Was that, was that one of the things you thought maybe he was wrong on or how, how did that all come about? Um, yeah, so for a lot of my career, I was clearly very frustrated with the throws and the shot put was, was one of those things. Um, and I came to practice, you know, for a normal shot put day. I, frankly, I forget what year, but I think it was maybe 2010, my senior year of college. Um, and it wasn't going well. And I was warming up or I was throwing against the a big wall underneath Hayward Field, the West Grandstands, where, where we trained a lot. And I was, I was really just frustrated. And so I kind of did this thing where I, you know, like a crow hop in baseball, mm -hmm. an outfielder gets a ball, they do a crow hop to try to throw it to home or throw it to second base. It was kind of like that sort of movement with the shot in my hand and I threw it against the wall. And I felt just incredible power and speed of the ball coming off my hand. And I said, Harry, did you see that? And he goes, do it again, do it again. And so I did it again, I, I smashed it, you know, I smashed against the wall without really ever using the constraint of the ring. You know, I wasn't in the ring. I was just right. doing it on the ground. And then I was like, you know what? Let's, let's measure out a ring without actually getting in one and see if I can do this within that space. Right. So I bring my it a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. And eventually I was able to do it in, t in the ring. 
and I was I was facing sideways, if if you will. Um, a lot of shot put technique, you face out of the back of the ring. Right. And, but then over time, I started slowly rotating, rotating, rotating until I was in a position where it was very similar to a shot put start, but I almost had this crow hop shuffle that I'd been mm -hmm. adapting uh, in the middle of it. And this happened really over the course of a day, and uh, you know Harry was right there with me experimenting, and that's you know the other thing I love is his ability to have known about technique that's 100 years old and that he's been practicing for 45 would be willing to to see and and be open to a new side of it which was maybe the shuffle thing actually works for ashton yeah and it ended up you know i think from that that point on i never i pr'd by like four feet <laughs> the first time i the first time i used it in a competition and uh, was able to kind of throw you know 44 45 46 after that wow uh, i love innovative stories, but even more importantly, innovative stories that equal positive results. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll take a four foot PR for any thrower, but especially a, a multi thrower. Yeah. And what, you know, what's beautiful about it is too, is Harry was, he adapted it into his system of um, coaching younger athletes. So some athletes that came to Oregon that were also training in the multis that really struggled with the, the throws, uh, mostly the weight of the shot, really they you know he's like try this shuffle and he was able to use his experience and kind of what we created to help younger athletes even be better at the throws hmm. that's awesome do we call yeah. it the ashton technique or the eaton or many what? people called it the eaton shuffle i don't know the what eaton it's shuffle. called shuffle all right <laughs> we're gonna keep that going i like the eaton shuffle uh so things get really good they continue to be good you, you before harry you had won the ncaa championships you win a couple of more championships at the indoor collegiate record um i believe and i had missed this but i believe harry corrected me you just missed the decathlon collegiate record is that correct that's right that's it right seems... trey hardy had it and i think i was supposed to run like a second faster than 15 and i didn't it seems hard to believe that you wouldn't have that uh and, and as a guy that used to coach trey back in his mississippi state days it just kills me that you didn't break his record ah, <laughs> close, close. let's move to 2012 uh, Harry gave us a, just an awesome story, uh, starting at the Olympic trials of the decathlon there and going through the competition. And you're doing real well. Day one's over. You're, you're phenomenal. Don't, uh, you start day two. And I think it was around, I think he said it was around the pole vault. He started getting texts, which is funny now that he didn't even really text <laughs> when you first started. He caught him. Uh, he caught him quick. <laughs> that's exactly a step up it's, when you ask us to step up you step up learn how to use text that's right <laughs> he uh he started getting text messages from around the world and i can only imagine a guy who is as connected in the decathlon world as harry how many text and, and stuff that he would have gotten uh, about the opportunity for you to set the world record and he tells us that through this maybe the seventh event or right around there you at least to him you you tell us the truth now you didn't talk about it at all and then he goes down to the i'm gonna call it the call room or, or whatever I, I think it was after, it was after what's, pole that, what's after the pole vault do you, do you still just the javelin in 15 that's right okay i think i was thought i was missing something so it goes hurdles discus pole vault pole vault, javelin, yeah. got it okay so yeah it was after the pole vault he came down to you and he, he tells the story of you, you said, all right, let's, I'm paraphrasing here. All right, Harry, let's cut the crap. What do I need to do to set the American record? And I, and I can't do a Harry impression to save my life, but he was like, Ashton, the American, no, the world record. So yeah. tell us in your words, did you ever, when did you really start thinking you might be able to set the record? What record was that the American or the world that you thought you could do? And then when he said, not the American, we're talking about the world. What went through your mind? Yeah, after the pole vaults, I think I'd PR'd at five meters 30. And I knew I was on pace to score, I think like 88 or 89 or something like that. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole time going into the Olympic trials, our goal was really just to get top three, not to win, not to uh, break any records. It was just get top three, go to the Olympics and then take care of stuff there. Um, and so after I jumped that, you know, we obviously meet after every um, uh, event. And so right. we go to the call room or the decathlon room and Harry comes to me with, uh, he always has a little scratch pad, a little piece of paper. And he comes to me with all these notes about the javelin. And he's like, Ash, when you're going on the javelin runway, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You got to really use your hip. 
and you know, just level, level it off, and it's gonna fly. And I'm telling you, if you if you can get out there, and I'm thinking, man, he really wants me to throw far. Um, because right now it's clear that we're gonna get top three, but he's really wanted me to throw far, so there must be some kind of record on the line. So, so you had no, you were no, not thinking any record. No. Okay. Uh, and and he's and I said it must be the American because I knew as I think it was like Dan O'Brien or Brian Clay at, at 89 or 88 something. Okay. Um, and I was like, all right, coach, what do I have to throw to get the American record? Cause it's clear, you know, you want me to try to do that. All right. He just put his paper down. He goes, Ashton, not the American record, the world record. And what? I just felt a cold flush oh. go through my whole body. And I said, the world record. And I don't know what I honestly said after that, but I don't think it was much. I remember <laughs> going to the uh, treatment kind of table and getting um, a massage. And I think we had about an hour until Javelin. And I just remember laying there and, and thinking. And I don't know, I, frankly, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, I just, for some reason, I remember that hour just being me kind of laying on that table thinking, is this really possible? And at the time, Harry was coming up to me and he goes, Ash, I just heard from uh, Klaus Marek in, in uh, Germany. He goes, you must do it. You got to go for it. And he comes and he punches me on my shoulder. He's like, you can do it. <laughs> and uh, he's like, hey, I just heard from so-and-so in Estonia. You can do it. They must do it. And uh, yeah, that, that was that moment. We were right under the West Grandstands and um, right near the finish line in Hayward there. We hadn't gone underneath yet. So it's where the athletes come out mm -hmm. to get onto the track. And I was just standing there. And uh, I just remember that cold flush in his piece of paper and then his eyes, you know, under his glasses, world record. It's just like, wow. So you mentioned cold flush and then kind of almost like you don't remember much as far as like, you, you know, you went and got your massage and things like that. Was it a sense of fear or was it more of a sense of like calmness of, okay, I guess I got to go out and either do it or try to do it. What was your attitude there? I was very nervous because I had to throw, you know, if I threw 60 meters and I ran a 4.18, um, which was my PR at the time, it was like one or two points above it. And I know that those margins are insanely close. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I was just nervous. I was like, I don't know if this is going to be possible. Um, I'm going to try, but like, what, what happens if I'm the guy that's so close and I don't make it? And uh, I, I think I ended up throwing like 57 meters. I was like, ah, oh, geez. And then I had to run, I think, a 416. And I was just like, man, I don't know if I can do that. Um, and so really the whole time was just, this, it was, you know, nervousness. It's like, what is it? A combination of fear and anxiety, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's it mostly just, I was, I was very nervous. And of course, spoiler alert, you did set the world record. Uh, it's yeah. still one of the only world records I've ever seen in person, by the way. I guess, oh. I, guess I get the opportunity to say, thank you, Ashton. Thank you for Absolutely. doing that while I was there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but to stay focused on Harry, what did Harry say to you? What was the reaction when he finally was able to get to you after now knowing you set the world record? You know, Harry has this ability to, even though I'm, I was talking about him kind of getting excited and fired up, he also has the ability to kind of be calm and I don't know how to explain it, but he, he doesn't, he, he actually doesn't make you feel nervous. So you don't feel like there's a lot of pressure from him. Like you have to do it. And if you, if you do have a bad javelin, um, which I did that, it, you know, all is lost. He is like insanely optimistic and believes that it, it can always be, be done and be there and, and really believes in, in me. So from, what I got from Harry was, I, I you know, I kind of wonder what he, what he was going through his mind too, as a coach thinking, man, I'm, I'm a coach, the world record holder in the decathlon. Um, and I think at that point, he just kind of let me go. And he said, you know, he said, I, I just believe you can do it. Hmm. I, I do remember before I went down from the call room into the, we, we actually went into the storage shed by the weight room in Hayward by the 1500 meter start. We were mm -hmm. just sitting under there for a while. He goes, Ashton, no matter what happens, you're going to be an Olympian and I'm proud of you. And you go out there and you give it everything. You give oh, it man. everything that I know you can give and just have fun. 
and uh, you know, pat on the shoulder and a hug, and then we were off. Yeah, that's awesome. It, uh, I'm so glad it worked out that you know the opportunity to set any world record is rare <laughs> at best. And uh, with the when you talk about any individual events, there's so many things can go wrong. You now stack ten of those events. Uh, I, I mean, it's everything has to fire uh on the on the right cylinders there man so super super excited and super excited that harry was there uh with that it was really really amazing uh time and moment and then you follow that up with you then go to the olympics uh in london that year and uh win the gold medal what, what right. was better winning the gold medal or setting the world record i'm setting the world record for sure um it, you know the reason i say that was well in retrospect it's really easy if I hadn't won the gold medal, uh, well, I don't know. I, anyway, the way I feel now is the world record is, is, was better. And maybe there's a combination of things there that the fact that it was at Hayward Fields in Oregon, where I'm from. Um, but, you know, I th not to downplay the gold medal, I think it was awesome. And it's like a big goal of mine, but I've always been the type of person that really liked to, um, you know, advance the cause, if you will, and kind of push the boundary forward to inspire others and you know show people what's possible and i feel like you know i won the gold medal but it wasn't really that uh it wasn't like a score that moved the sport or the decathlon forward whereas the world record it was like i think my way to contribute to the future saying we it can still be done like yeah. let's keep pushing it forward and and i actually believe that the world record being broken by kevin Mayer um recently in 2018 uh, he so much has said, like, look, to be able to compete with you and see it's it's actually possible and it doesn't take like this crazy thing was was really helpful to know that I could do it one day myself. Yeah, very similar to Bannister's first time breaking the four minute mile and then everybody saw, oh, wait a minute, we can do that too. And, right. uh, you know, the overall performances in the hundred have gotten a lot better once Bolt went crazy and went nine, five, eight or whatever, you know? Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Hey, and you know, in retrospect, Ashton, I'm sorry, that actually was a terrible question to ask what was better, the world record or the gold medal. That's like asking you to pick your favorite child, by the way. No, no, I, uh, but I, I do like a lot of people do ask, you know, and I think the, the common answer is the gold medal is better because you get to keep it. Whereas the world record hmm. always goes on to somebody else. But I see more of the world record as like a rung and a ladder that should be ever ascending. And I was able to just like put the rung a little higher so we could get, you know, a little further along. No, that's a great, great point. Again, may or may not have ever set the record if it was, if you had never set it to see that, oh, okay, wait a minute, he can do it. Then maybe I can too. That's, that's a great, great mindset there. So 2014, uh, just something that's never happened. <laughs> you decide uh, all these gold medals and world records. You know what? I'm just going to go do the 400 hurdles. Uh, talk to us about uh, the discussion with Harry, how that came up and why that came up. For sure. You know, after 2013 Moscow, um, Harry, I, I, we were all tired. Brian, Harry, and I. And it was from the 2011, 12, 13 kind of World Olympics Worlds uh, set. And I knew if we were going to go for the um, uh, the 15, 16, and possibly 17 worlds set that we needed a break. And I, I told Harry one day, I was like, coach, I think in 2014, we should do indoor and then just take it off the decathlon and not do it. And I told him my reasoning. I was like, this set was exhausting for all of us. And um, I think to do the next set and be successful, like we need a mental break. And he goes, Absolutely. I love it. I love the idea. Absolutely. And he's like, I've never done anything like that, but he was all for it. And um, then, so he decided, uh, you know, it was like, what, what events would we do? We could do select events here and there. And I, and I said, I've always wanted to try the 400 hurdles. And he said, you know, that'd be great because to get stronger in the 400 would not only help your whole decathlon, um, but it, it would just help your whole decathlon of course. And so from that point on, we, uh, we started training in the 400 meter hurdles. Harry did a lot of research. Um, he also obviously has hurdle background, but started looking up, uh, you know, step counts and things like that. And I did my own fooling around. So again, it was, it was, a uh, it was, a uh, uh, an experiment that we were doing that just was fun, man. It, and we had so much fun kind of traveling around and, and doing 400 hurdles. And I think for Harry as a coach, not having the stress of the decathlon, I mean, obviously he's still coaching Brianne. And it has its own thing, but for him to manage one athlete over over two, I think was really helpful. And uh, 
it was, you know, I look back on that year as an athlete as one of the most fun years because I was like on the circuit, you know? Oh, trying. right. Yeah. yeah. Because the Kathlon's not there, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And I, I did like six meets in the span of two months and I was kind of traveling around all these different hotels and I got to see what other athletes did because uh, we don't normally do that. And I said, man, this is really awesome. You guys have a really cool, swell thing going here. And he was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, we've been doing it for like a long time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it was fun. What was the reception from the 400 hurdlers? Here's this, uh, here's this decathlon guy thinking he's going to step into what some people call the hardest event in track and field, the 400 hurdles. Were you received well or did, was there a little bit of animosity? You know, it's funny. I, sometimes in the call rooms, I was, I was actually more nervous in the 400 meter call rooms than I was in the decathlon ones because I felt like maybe a little bit out of place. Um, but they, all the athletes received me well. Their, their uh, initial impression to me was like, what's this guy doing here? Um, you know, and, and is he going to be fast? Like, I don't know yet right. because initially I think I ran like 50 point, which is not that great at all. Right. Then I started getting faster and then they started saying, man, Ashton, I hope you're outside, you know, on, on the lane outside of me so I could watch. You. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, I had a lot of fun and I think they did too. And, um, I had a lot, got a lot of respect. I have, I had already a lot of respect for many of the athletes, um, in all the events, but even more so for 400 hurdles because, it is, it is complex. Um, you have to design your stride counts based on your training, which I didn't know, but it makes sense now. Um, and so there's, there's just a lot of nuances that make it a difficult race. You uh, obviously have a ton of talent in the 100 meter dash, the long jump. Uh, a lot of people said you should have been a pole vaulter. <laughs> uh, yeah. Was there ever consideration to do one of the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say traditional events, but that's not right. One of the decathlon events, as your one event through the year, or was it maybe more beneficial to get completely away from the decathlon and go to the 400 hurdles? Well, you know, that year we did do indoor worlds in Sopot, mm -hmm. um, Poland. And so that took us kind of through like the March uh, timeframe of doing uh, the multi events and kind of still training in some of those events. And even at training, I would do uh, a lot of the events still, especially the throws. Um, but there was talk of, hey, maybe doing the pole vault more and kind of like specializing in that for a while, if you will. And that, that was actually even talk after we had decided, hey, maybe we're not going to do the decathlon anymore after 2016. Um, mm. My manager especially said, hey, what would you do for open pole vault? <laughs> it's, ah, no, I don't think so. But pole vault, pole vault's one of my favorite events. You know, people always ask, what's your favorite event? And I, I do break it up into a field event and a track event. Mm -hmm. And my favorite field event, uh, it used to be long jump, but it's it's definitely pole vault. Um, my favorite track event is the, the 400. I could see the pole vault being your favorite field event. Um, having discussions with you when you're an athlete and uh, through that Gill Athletics with the poles and things like that, the uh, cerebralness of the pole vault matches you and, and Harry, to be quite frank, uh, matches you guys really well about, you know, it's not just get in the blocks and run a hundred or, uh, you know, your step count and jump off the board for the long jump. There's so many factors into the pole vault. I could see that really being like one of your favorite events there. Yeah. Yeah. We loved working on the pole vault. It was, uh, I think of it, an event where I still had a lot more potential that I didn't fulfill, which it is what it is, but we didn't really spend that much time on it because it was a solid staple and there's just a high mm. chance of injury uh, when you're training and you're tired. And one of Harry's kind of principles was, you know, injury mitigation. So, mm. um, yeah, he mentioned that in the point distribution as far as like how many points you get per second in the 15 versus every yeah. bar in the a high jump in pole vault. And it was a no brainer. And then as it went to the pole vault, I, I think in that world record, you guys actually, correct me if I'm wrong, you actually stopped pole vault. You didn't go until you were out of the competition. There was a point you hit 530 or whatever it was and they're like, okay, let's stop there and let's get ready for the rest. And he said he took, um, I don't know if he said he took a lot of heat, but he took a lot of judgment. People were like, Harry, he's, he's doing awesome. Let him, let him keep jumping. And you know, Harry's mind was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got other events we got to go on to. Yeah. I mean, he's, it's, there, there are people who do that and kind of give him and, and us flack for decisions we've made, but um, they're obviously based on our experience and, and all the data that we have from our practices and mm -hmm. how, 
I know my body and things like that and how Harry, Harry, Harry knows the, the events as well. And so when somebody's like, why don't you just jump until it's over? It's like, well, we've got sound reasoning for why, and we're not just going to explain it, you know, an entire career training as to that. Um, and he also got heat at the Olympic games when I chose to come in at, uh, well, we chose to come in at four meters 60 in the pole vault. Um, and, you know, we're sitting there in London and I'm doing great. And I come in at four meters 60 and it's kind of like, why are you coming in so low? Mm. It's like strategically, uh, you know, if the goal here is to win, that's what we need. That's all we need right there. And then that takes the, pre the mental pressure off an athlete, which actually matters because you don't want to get in a two bar situation where yeah. I wasn't Rio actually. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden you're like mentally screwing yourself up. But yeah, anyway, there's, there's, uh, that trust and confidence in the program also that Harry has, that's also been really helpful. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's amazing when people from the outside try to say, well, you should have done this. You should have done that. And it's like, you don't understand the trust and communication and relationship that coach and athlete have. They they're with, they're with each other every day in practice. You're seeing a one-time event yep. pole vault at this decathlon. You, you have no idea what's actually going on. So um, I love how you talked about that mental side if the goal is to win, well, it's not just where you come in and where you finish uh, as far as, you know, do you come in the highest and things like that? It's the mental side of, Oh man, if I clear a couple bars, okay. I feel the athlete puts themselves in a better position to do better in the rest of the events. Yeah. I mean, the decathlon's a complete mental game. If it's a 13 hour a day competition at uh, like it was in Rio in London and some of these world championships, um, you're actually only competing for about six minutes total in that 13 hours, which means, 4% of your time is used on performance. And it's like, mm -hmm. what's the rest of that time? Well, you probably thinking, reflecting, staying warmed up, blah, blah, blah. If you're in a bad headspace during that and you're constantly worried about the next event, that's like energy lost that mm -hmm. matters. So, um, you know, the other thing too is Harry was the full on architect of our program uh, from many facets. So he, he was, you know, managing uh, and making sure like the physio matched up with the training mm -hmm. and I would show up to competitions with my poles just there and he would take care of all that stuff. And so, uh, you know, from that aspect, offloading a lot of mental stuff onto Harry was where it was super beneficial too. Cause I never felt like I had to take ownership of something or was ever worried about, um, something because Harry had always already thought of it and he would be at practice Every day, every single day of my career, of our career, um, an hour at least before. And everything was set up for the day mm -hmm. uh, since I met him at college. And he, he would be sending us emails at sometimes one, two in the morning <laughs> when we would have a bad day saying, I figured it out. Here's what you need to do in the discus. We're trying this tomorrow. And so it was that kind of level where I knew there's nothing that is going to get through his filter. He will think of all of it, uh, and as an athlete, that's like amazing. Yeah, he definitely gave you the opportunity to focus on being the best athlete, not worried about setting up hurdles and cones and all that kind of stuff. And he uh, he cracked me up in the uh, interviews with him when he was talking about exactly what you said. He'd wake up at three, four in the morning and be like, "Aha, I got it!" And he would run to his email and type it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still have some of those emails too. I can pull oh, them up right now. That would be <laughs> oh, all man. Actually. That's awesome. <laughs> well, let's continue moving forward here. And it's crazy. I'm going to skip over your world champs gold medal and world record and your Rio gold medal. Uh, you know, you just got so many of those, Ashton. We're just going to skip right by that. And after the 2016 Rio Olympics, where again, you won the gold medal there, um, and it came out. I think in that fall, I think November or December, you and Brianne, and we got to make sure we're giving shout out and props to Brianne, and we're going to talk about her here as well. Uh, your girlfriend in college, I'm not sure when you guys actually got married, but you got married as well, and she is no slouch herself here, folks. Uh, many, many medals on the international scene in heptathlon. Uh, I believe she either... Olympic bronze. Yeah, did she set the NCAA record as well? I think. Oh my gosh, I don't know, but I yeah. think so. Yes, I think she. I did. think so. Yeah, yeah I mean, was NCAA record. That's yeah, right. I mean, let's not just completely bypass. I wish she was here with us. Um, but you guys, after Rio, she gets the bronze medal. You get the gold medal. Uh, holy cow, overachievers! By the way, <laughs> um, you guys. Uh, so, 
you guys start having discussions and talk to us about and the role that Harry played into this, your decision to retire from track and field competitions. For sure. Our plan was actually to think about going to 2017 World Championships and that'd be our last competition and a nice bookend where we kind of did London and it was great in our first Olympics and we could finish in London. Mm -hmm. We really loved that uh, kind of venue and competition. Mm -hmm. But as we took time off, which we typically took about three months off after a major competition, uh, we went and said, look, we're not going to think about track. We're actually not going to make any decisions about the future because we need to rest and just, we know if we made a decision right after Rio, it would actually be, no, we're not going because we're so tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, right. um, but uh, so we took some time off and we honestly did not talk to Harry, which was typical. We, we didn't really talk to coach for probably the first month of our break. Mm -hmm. And it was all good for us to all just kind of decompress. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he's like, hey, let's get together and start talking about, you know, the training plans for 2017. And he would always come to our house or we'd go to his and he'd have a yellow notepad. And uh, this was November. And uh, we had traveled the world, I think, a little bit also after after Rio. Oh, good, yeah. And he came <laughs> and he usually had a, a, a long list of items to do for training and how, how we might be getting back into it. And he came, he set his yellow notepad down, and he goes, guys, it's blank. <laughs> oh. He says, what are you doing? And he's like, I think I know, but I just want to hear. So do, he, he had an inkling? Yeah. Mm. And uh, we looked at him. We looked at each other. We looked at him. And he said, we said, coach, we're done. And we had come to that decision um, a few weeks or about a month earlier. And I had come to it actually quite a bit earlier than that. But both Brianna and I, and she had, had asked me one night, she's like, so what do you want to do? Uh, continue and I said I'm done she's like really you know it I was like I know it I'm ready to move on and she goes oh my gosh wow 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 and uh, she went out on a run that day she's like I need to figure this out so she went out on a run oh no no sorry she was she had gone on a run already that day and she said in her mind on that run she was contemplating going back to training and she's like I just don't think I can do this like even this run, like the thought of going back and training again is just not exciting anymore. So she, so she had come home that night. She said, what do you do? What do you think? And I said, I, I, I think I'm done. She goes, no way. I had the same thought. And so kind of at the yeah, same time, cool. We, just, we do it. So anyways, we told Harry and he goes, you guys, I think that is one of the best decisions. Um, wow. I'm totally in support of it. And the reason is because you guys had an incredible career. You fought hard. You ended victorious and champions and exact, did, doing exactly what you wanted to do. And yeah, you could go to London and kind of bookend it and whatever, but we could go into a season and have injuries. He's like, and I've seen athletes do it. Let's just, we had an, an incredible time and we finished it at Rio. We got done what we wanted to. And that's the end of our story. And I think it's perfect. We said, absolutely, coach. So I think we all kind of teared up, uh, had some wine and had some hugs. And then, you know, what are we going to do next type of thing? He mentioned a story. You guys were going to dinner the next night or that weekend yeah. and you guys stopped at Hayward field. Yeah. Uh, it cracked me up. He tells me we stop at Hayward field there at the gate. You get out with your keys and open the gate. And I was like, of course, Ashton Eaton has keys to Hayward field. And you yeah. guys did kind of one lap final lap at Hayward field. So I think we actually, we went to Beppe and Gianni's. Yep, that was it. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, Harry loves Italian and, you know, Beppe's <laughs> is a staple there in Eugene, right next to Hayward, right, right across from Prince Puckler's ice cream. And uh, we did a final uh, lap together. And, uh, you know, it was our last time on Hayward Field as uh, coaches and athletes. And just, yeah, I don't know. It was our victory lap, you know, kind of there, Hayward Fields. And then we went to Beppe's and had some, Italian food and wine. <laughs> That's the way to do it right there. <laughs> so I had mentioned about, you know, making sure we shout out Brianne, not only because she's your wife, but again, on her own merits as an athlete. When I was talking with Ashton, or I'm sorry, when I was talking with Harry through the interviews here on the podcast, uh, you know, I really, we delved into his side of having a couple, a married couple at such a high level, um, 
in athletics in the same, I'm doing air quotes here, the same event. I know there's some radical differences between the heptathlon and the decathlon, but the, you know, you're, you're multi-athlete, you're combined athletes. And I asked him early on in the interview, I said, is Ashton and Brienne together, is that a case of where one plus one equals three? And he mentioned some, uh, you know, he said yes, and you know, you guys were always pushing each other and, you know, taking care of things at home with uh, diets and things like that. Uh, yep. He actually said you might have been a little distracted, actually, because you would be uh, watching her warm up and yelling at her to get her lead leg down and things like that. And he was like, Ashton, focus on the pole vault. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end of this uh, beautiful three-part series with Harry uh, that I'm just so humbled to be, uh, to be able to bring to everybody, it actually kind of dawned on me right at the end of the part three, I said, Harry, uh, you know, I talked about Ashton and Reeve being one plus one equals three. I was like, I'm starting to actually get the sense that this was one plus one plus one equals four. You know, Harry and Brianne and Ashton together, that combination, it was greater than the sum of its of its parts. Um, am I off base here? I mean, was Harry that part of it or? Yeah, oh, I mean, it's one plus one plus one equals 10 for sure. Harry 10. is- uh, I should have said 10. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Brianna and I are very different athletes. We approach things um, quite differently, and we also have different reactions to to things. And for Harry to, in practice, bounce back and forth between um, necessary coaching styles was, you know, a, a perfect display in the art of coaching in itself every day. And I think any any interviewer uh, that was able to come watch us practice sometimes you know people want to write articles or whatnot and we didn't allow them in um said just as much like wow this is mm. this is a, a an art form and you know harry mara's got this thing dialed and so it was him again who, who was really that glue in that um that uh found that foundation of us being able to fulfill the potential that we had as athletes and yeah, I, th I think my thing is um, Harry's knowledge, you know, at this point is, is in my opinion, is um, an untapped resource that should absolutely be tapped, not just in the sport of track and field, but in the art of coaching. And we have all these coaches around the nation in ver various sports, some of them young in their careers, who would benefit and therefore their athletes, uh, and therefore, you know, the world in general, who would benefit from uh, Harry's insight. Yeah, and, uh, certainly yeah. can't agree with you more than that. That's, that's for sure uh, with that aspect of it. Uh, it. You know, that culmination, you mentioned that, that last lap on Hayward Field, and, you know, we're getting close to unveiling the new Hayward Field, um, we were, we, it's funny, we were in our sales meeting this morning, we were talking about the torch that's going to be at the new Hayward Field. And uh, I, I was bragging to the team that I got to interview the great Ashton Eaton today and, uh, <laughs> to help some of our non track you know, we got basketball and volleyball people to help them understand. I was like, if you were to build a Mount Rushmore for Oregon track and field, that's essentially what this torch is. I go, and this guy, Ashton, he's on there. What does it mean? I mean, I, I would not have wanted to be in the selection committee, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh -huh. the culmination, when you when we see your picture up there, it's uh, obviously we, we see you and your world records and gold medals and NCAA champs, but we also see the Harry Mara that stands with you and the Dan Steele and Vin Lanana, the coaches that are with you. What's it mean to be on that torch? It's, I don't, you know, it's just uh yeah, it's, it's sentimental and it's like a massive, massive honor. I mean, I was born in Portland. I grew up down the street in central Oregon. I did my high school state competitions at Hayward Field and uh, I became kind of the person that I am and the, the opportunities and experience um, in my life on earth was a, lot, a large portion of it was because of Hayward Field and the experiences that I had there every day since I was uh, a kid in high school. So to be actually part of it now and um, having had that kind of success there, um, I don't know, you just can't, you probably have to write a very well-written 
poem or, or something that I, I can't really articulate right now, but it means a lot. Uh, you, to bring it back to the lighter side here, you know your kid is going to be embarrassed by you one day as you look up and see your, it's like, there's my dad. That's just so embarrassing to me. Yeah. <laughs> you tell him. You tell him. It would make me the most happy if he goes, wait a minute, dad, is that you? <laughs> I, mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah it's, I, won't, I won't lie to him, but uh, yeah. Boy, I'm going to guess he'll know before he goes <laughs> and sees that. Hey, Ashton, as we wrap up today, and uh, really, uh, while it is certainly an honor to talk to you about your accomplishments, and you've had so many, uh, it's really about honoring, uh, as you mentioned, about uh, Harry's knowledge and care and trust and communication with you. Uh, to wrap it up here, what do you maybe want the world to know about Harry? For those who don't, who don't have the honor, honestly, and blessing to know him, what would you want them to know about Coach Harry Merrow? Um, I, I, would, I would want them to know that I think he's one of the best coaches who's ever lived. And uh, I think I have license to say that. I've had a lot of coaches in my life. And even though I haven't um, experienced many of the coaches of many of the other sports, the decathlon encompasses a lot of the elements of many sports in the world. Um, and Harry has spent his life dedicated to advancing this discipline, which is as ancient as the Olympic games are really. And so he's, he's one of the best coaches in the world. Um, and I, I think that more than that, the reason because he, the, the reason he is, is because he's a, he's a person that really understands people mm -hmm. and has, has a love of sport a love of kind of the, the, the struggle and the fight and the, and the growth that a human being goes through when they try to uh, go down this kind of path in these, these endeavors. So I think he really understands uh, life and I think it's apparent and it, it kind of comes to life through his coaching and I think that's why he's one of the best coaches. Well, I can't wait for him to hear this interview. Although he's spoken to you many, many times, uh, the, the goal here is, again, to honor and really let people know who don't know Harry Mara and what a great asset he is. Uh, and not, not past tense, he is a, an amazing asset today to coaches around there. Uh, yes. And Ashton, this, was, this exceeded my wildest dreams. There are so many parallels to stories that you told, that he told. Uh, <laughs> You mentioned about having those emails. I'm going to challenge you. You need to write a book one day. I think so. About I mean, Harry has written a book, by the way. What? Of course he didn't mention that. What? 100%. When we were training, uh, he would leave, practice, go back home. Uh, we had given him a computer, and he may still have it. And he typed on that sucker every day for hours. And he has, I think, about 350,000 words that are unpublished on his coaching. We got we to gotta make that happen, Kevin. Yeah, gotta absolutely. Get, got to get done. Ashton, thank you so much for your time here, honoring uh, one of the many great coaches you've had, but certainly what a great time frame you and Bree and Harry together for track and field is really something special. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me.